Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. There are so many people in the Jewish community doing interesting and creative things, and it's always a pleasure to be able to sit with one of them to give you a chance to meet them and to learn from them. So I'm very pleased to welcome now a man who combines a number of various interests and expertise from electronic engineering to Mideast policy. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Avi Perry, who in addition to having worked for many years in the technology industries, has also served as an intelligence expert for the Israeli government. And for example, Avi, who is a Sabra, born in Israel, Avi was called away from his university studies during the Six-Day War of 1967 to serve in the Israeli military in the field of covert intelligence communications technology. Avi Perry is also the author of a number of books. He's uh, the author of a recent novel, 72 Virgins, a thriller about the covert war on Islamic terror. He's also written in the field of expertise, his own professional expertise. I have here a book. I don't even know if I understand what it's about. The Fundamentals of Voice Quality Engineering in Wireless Networks. Avi Perry, you're a remarkable human being. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, talk to me one moment about your background, then we'll talk about substance. You were born in Israel. Yes. Where were you born? I was born in Haifa when the British still controlled the country. This is Mandate Palestine then? That's right. Okay. Um, but I mean, I assume you were a very young child in 1948. Is that true? I was uh, just about uh, five years old at that time. Okay. And where were your parents at that time? Also in Haifa? They were in Haifa. Where did they come from? They came from Poland. Um, my father came as an illegal immigrant. My mother came as a legal immigrant. Uh, and they came as teenagers. From Poland? From Poland, both of them. They didn't know each other. They met each other in Israel. Was your father part of Ali Abet? Uh, yes. So he was smuggled into the country? That's correct. He told me the story how he jumped off the boat and swam to the shore and stuff like that. Amazing. Uh, just out of curiosity, was your father more... Did he lean more to Likud and Begin than he did to the Yeshuv establishment and Ben-Gurion? It's interesting. My father was a leftist. Uh, at least part of his life he was leftist. But he admired Begin. He, uh, admired, he was worried about Begin becoming prime minister, but he admired his oratory or his, his way of delivering a message. He admired him. And he took me to several of his campaign uh, speeches. To Begin's campaign. To Begin's campaign so speeches. So you heard him? Yes, I did. Oh, yes. He was amazing, wasn't he? He was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yes. At that time, anyway. I, today, you probably have more like him. But at that time, he was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Was your father, did he live long enough to see Begin become prime minister? Well, my father uh, passed away at a young age. I'm sorry. Uh, in uh, 1980, when he, when he was 65. Okay, so, so so Begin had just become prime minister. That's right. What was your father's name? Tzvi. Tzvi. And your mother? My, mother name, my mother's name is Tova. Tova. Very, very lovely. Yes. So you're raised as a, you know, a young Israeli kid Yes. in Haifa most of your life? Most of my life in Haifa. Uh, uh, then I joined the military, and then I went to the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I got married uh, over there, and uh, we lived there for about five years. Okay. Five I, already years. I already mentioned that you served in the Six-Day War. That's right. In an area of covert intelligence technology, correct? Right, that's correct. And then ultimately you come to America and establish a professional career here. That's correct. Okay, and you do extraordinary things in terms of your professional career, but you also retain a connection to Israel and ultimately you also are looked to when I mean, you write in the Jerusalem Post for Arud Sheva 
you do you know uh, an online program of your own and you have been interviewed by Al Jazeera, correct? That's correct. Yes. And so you are something of a Middle East expert as well, and, and I'm interested in asking you some of the questions that many of us here in America, the American Jewish community, is asking all the time. I want to understand from your perspective, to what extent do you believe that Israel in particular and the West in general is now confronting a serious Islamic extremist terrorist threat? There is definitely an Islamic threat to Israel and the, the, the rest of the world. Um, uh, Iran is uh, leading that Islamic threat, and uh, Iran is posing a great danger to Israel and to the rest of the world as well. Uh, their plan, and they have announced it many, many times before, is to establish a caliphate uh, throughout the world. Um, many, many people in the world believe that Iran is an Israeli problem. Mm -hmm. They don't really understand that Iran is not just an Israeli problem. It is a global problem. Um, Saudi Arabia, for example, approached the United States and put pressure on President Obama, uh, trying to convince him that he should stop Iran's development of nuclear weapons. Saudi Arabia. There has been an agreement, well, people were talking about it in the press, between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now, that's sort of unheard of, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the agreement said that Saudi Arabia would let Israel go through or fly through Saudi ter territory when they go to bomb Iran's nuclear weapons. So a lot of people look up to Israel and say, you go and do the dirty job for us. Um, many people in the United States, by the way, are complaining about uh, the situation with Iran. They, they complain, they say, why should America go and do Israel's dirty job? They are mistaken. The job is not a dirty job for Israel. It's a, it's a job that the United States must do to protect itself. Because once Iran becomes nuclear, the rest of the Middle East will enter a, an arms race. Saudi Arabia will try to uh, acquire nuclear bombs. Egypt will try to acquire a nuclear bomb. Turkey will try to acquire a nuclear bomb. The interesting part of it is that everybody knows that Israel has a nuclear bomb, and nobody rushed to acquire one mm -hmm. as a result of that. Israel did not pose a threat to the world, even to its enemies when it had a nuclear bomb. Iran doesn't have a nuclear bomb yet, yet it poses a great threat to the Arab countries in the Middle East, and they are scared of it. The United States and the rest of the Western world understand that a nuclear bomb poses a danger not just to Israel, but to the rest of the Arab world and to the rest of the world. Iran today develops missiles that can reach southern Europe. In a few years, it will reach Western Europe. In a few more years, it could reach the eastern part of the United States. And then, of course, it will cover the rest of the United States. Can you imagine these missiles with nuclear bombs? Is there any circumstance you could imagine where if Israel felt it were under dire attack from a concerted coalition of Arab armies, where it would use a nuclear weapon? Yes. Uh, they call it the Masada principle. Uh, yes, there is a principle like that in Israel, and it's well understood. In fact, in the 1973 war, uh, where Egypt and Syria attacked Israel, and there was a threat in the very first few days when Israel ran out of weapons, actually, ran out of bullets, um, there was nothing else. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety in the government and a fear that uh, the Arab forces will move into Israel and try to basically wipe it off the map. And at that point, if they did that, I think that Israel would have resorted to nuclear bombs. I also think that Syria and Egypt understood that because uh, they stopped their attack 
Once they, once the Egyptian crossed the canal, the Suez Canal, uh, they they advanced for a few miles, and then they stopped. Uh, you can argue that they stopped because they did not have air cover, which is true too. Uh, but you can also argue that they stopped because they didn't want Israel to go to resort to nuclear bomb. They knew so. Here is an, an, an interesting example. On the one hand, the Arab countries knew Israel had a nuclear bomb, or at least they assumed, and probably their intelligence confirmed that Israel had a nuclear bomb. Uh, so the nuclear bomb served at that time as a deterrent. But at the same time, they did not go and try to acquire their own bomb because they knew, they knew very well that Israel will never use it against them unless the Masada principle kicks in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the main reason, or that is the main reason why Israel must have a nuclear bomb. Now, you also have to understand that a nuclear bomb in today's world will only, can only be used if you want to wipe out a whole population. Uh, in regular wars where two countries have some uh, demands uh, on, on There's a specific small objective, a military objective to in some way inflict either damage, destruction, and in some instances to wipe out an army. But it's very limited and specific is what you're saying. Right. But when you, the only reason you want to use a nuclear bomb is, is when you want to wipe, up, to wipe out millions of people, mm -hmm. civilians basically. And when you look at the world today, the only country who is under the threat of being wiped off the map is Israel. There's no other country in the world that is living under this kind of a cloud. Do you consider yourself to be leaning left or leaning right? I consider myself to be independent. I vote for Republicans or Democrat presidents or uh, senators or congressmen depending on who they are rather than what party they belong to. Is this also your view or your relationship to Israel? You are neither left nor right. That's correct. You experienced the state of Israel as a child. You have viewed it as an adult. You have a certain degree of expertise as you look at the Middle East as a whole. What is your feeling these days about the appropriateness of a two-state solution where if there were a Palestinian leadership that could deliver an honest state to live side by side with the Jewish state of Israel, would you say that that is the right thing for the state of Israel to do today? Where do you stand on the appropriateness of the two-state solution? Well, uh, I, I've written quite a bit on this topic. Um, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that there is no such a thing as a two-state. We have three states. I don't understand why people talk about two states. We have Hamastan in Gaza, which is separate from the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, and we have Israel. But you do understand, but we, you make a very important politi uh, political, historical, factual point. But you do understand what is meant. Yes. What they mean at the moment is they want to take the West Bank what some Jews want to call Judea Samaria. That's right. And they want to basically turn it over to the Palestinian Authority, yeah. create some kind of border, yes. create something with Jerusalem, right. and the two states should live and be well in peace. Right. That's the goal. What do you say? I think this goal is not feasible as of today, uh, mostly because the Palestinians are not ready to acknowledge the existence of a Jewish state in Israel. Uh, you can watch Palestinian TV, you can watch Palestinian Authority statements, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, statements on television and, and on paper, and, and you see that deep inside he does not want or does not want to admit that Israel exists as a Jewish state. In fact, he even said that he, yes, Israel exists, but why should it be why should it exist? Just Israel exists. It's a fact. I cannot deny it, but he doesn't want to admit that it exists as a Jewish state. In other words, it's another Palestinian state. Another Palestinian state. That's correct. 
from Mahmoud Abbas's perspective, you believe he sees Israel as a Palestinian state in process. Palestinian state with mixed population, whereas the West Bank is Palestinian state with no Jews in there. That's the way they see it. Now, the, the, the real problem that I have with the two-state solution is that the idea is great. I love the idea of having a two-state solution. I love the idea of having peace with the other state. This is a great idea. The only problem is that you cannot make peace with an unstable leader. Uh, in other words, the United States pressures Israel to make peace with Abbas. Abbas times is short. He's not going to be there for too many years. He's old. Not only is he old, he's tired. So let's give him five more years, which is a stretch. Okay? What happens after that? Uh, we, see, we, we saw what happened with Egypt now. I was amazed that the peace between Sadat and Begin lasted that long. But now comes Morsi. What happens now, we don't really know. The cold peace that we had with Egypt until now is slowly turning into a Cold War. I hope it's never going to turn hotter than that, but it's not a Cold Peace anymore. We don't talk, they don't talk to each other anymore. And Egypt even uh, moved troops and, and, and heavy military equipment into the Sinai outside and without Israel permission. Uh, they even moved anti-aircraft missiles to the Sinai. What do they need that for if, uh, if it's not something uh, to respond to Israeli imaginary threats? Uh, they need to fight the terror bases in the Sinai. Egy the Egyptians need to fight them because terror terrorists have taken control of the peninsula. But at the same time, they do not need anti-aircraft missiles in the Sinai to fight these terrorists. They do not need tanks to fight these terrorists. They need something else. They need light arm because it's going to be that kind of a war. Uh, when you fight terrorists, you don't need heavy equipment. And they did move everything in there without Israeli permission. So they slowly degrade the peace accord that was signed in 1979 between Begin and Sadat. And, uh, it becomes risky, and Israel has already protested to the United States about it. And now Morsi is in a position where he tries to blackmail the United States. He says, well, if you want me to move the, all this equipment back to Egypt, well, you have to give me more money. You have to sign loan guarantees for me. In other words, now he's in a position of power where he can blackmail the United States. And this relates to the West Bank how? Now, uh, the West Bank, like I said, we cannot make peace with a person. We have to make peace with the people. Mm -hmm. And if you have an open election in the West Bank, you'll find out that at least, at least 50% of the people in the West Bank support Hamas. Uh, I would say at least because I believe that it's more like 70%. So, and we don't want a Hamas government on the West Bank. Well, we don't want people, I don't know if it's Hamas, I don't want to have people who have aspirations mm -hmm. of wiping Israel off the map. And what does Israel do then in the meantime? Israel has, uh, has sustained its independence and its characteristic I I during the last 65 years. Are you saying that just maintain the status quo until and we have a partner? Change? Until we have a, a real partner. And there needs to be a change within the Palestinian population. That's right. They teach, they, they brainwash their children. So I would say that the next generation is almost lost. Okay. I want to tell you what I hear from those who are passionate about the future of Israel but do believe Israel is making a mistake. They say two things to me, basically. Number one, Israel is the stronger of the two, and therefore Israel has a greater responsibility than does the Palestinian community to initiate change. 
that ultimately Israel can't stay put, but that it must do everything it can to facilitate a change within the Palestinian community that would create the kind of leadership you're hoping to find. And the second thing they say to me is that ultimately the status quo is unacceptable for the immediate Israeli future. And that if something is not changed now, the longer you wait, the harder it will be. World opinion continues to be strongly against Israel. And although Israel has the ability to withstand the great deal, to pretend world opinion means nothing is to put one's head in the, st in the sand. And that ultimately, the second reason that Israel is encouraged to make some kind of concession is that if it doesn't, the status quo will continue to erode in a way that is bad for the Israeli soul, for the Israeli people, and that ultimately it is as bad a decision as would be trying to sort of make peace now with the people who are there. That's what I hear from, quite honestly, the Israeli, uh, the Israeli and the American Jewish left. What do you say? Well, uh, they th I, I say that they have to learn a lot more about Israel. Uh, in fact, I, I wrote an article uh, that was published in Israel National News a while ago. The title was, uh, what, what You Don't Know About Israel. And uh, in there, I described Israeli efforts of changing and, and going in exactly the direction you suggested, changing the Arab world's attitude toward Israel. For example, nobody really knows that on a daily basis, there are 2,000 Palestinians who cross the border into Israel to take uh, uh, to, to, to go to Israeli hospitals and to have Israeli doctors treat them for diseases like cancer, like heart type problems. Uh, they come from Gaza, from the West Bank, into Israel, and Israel provides them permission. They provide them with hotels next to the hospital to the parents who bring their children. They treat them like equals. They have them stay in the same room with Israeli kids, for example. I witnessed that. I went to Israeli hospital and saw these children there who are being treated by Israeli doctors, and then they go back to their home, and hopefully one day they will talk or they will change their mind about Israel. Uh, one of these persons that recently was treated by Israel was uh, uh, Ismail Haniyeh's brother-in-law. Ismail Haniya is the Prime Minister of Hamas in Gaza. Hmm. His brother-in-law came to Israel to get treatment for a heart condition because he couldn't get the same treatment in Gaza. He didn't go to Egypt. He didn't go to Jordan. He came to Israel. Do you think that changed Ismail Haniya's mind about Israel? Haniya still wants to see Israel wiped off the map, even after that. And your point is? The point is that we can change some people's mind. We can try. Israel has been trying. Okay. To what change. about the second issue, that the status quo is simply unacceptable for Israelis and that it does something to destroy the character of the state and in some way to afflict the Israeli soul? Right. Well, I think this is uh, misguided. I think that there are people in Israel and they're always where people in Israel who were on the left side of the agenda since the 1950s, right immediately after the War of Independence, there were people in Israel who advocated that Israel must do more to gain peace with the Arabs. And Israel has always tried to make peace with the Arabs. What do you do? Uh, let me just give you an example. Will the United States ever make peace with Al-Qaeda? The United States is stronger than Al-Qaeda. Just like you say, is, uh, the, the Israel is stronger than the Arab countries. Al-Qaeda doesn't want to make peace with America. What about the Palestinians? The Palestinians say, they say they do. No, they don't. They say it in English. <laughs> in Arabic, they say something totally different. 
Well, then why isn't the Arabic translated in, in the New York Times all the time? It's, it's uh, our uh, great reporters who do that great why do, job. And why doesn't Israel put this out? They day do. Day after day after they day. Do. They, they don't, Avi. They don't. I've been told by some people in Israel. There is, there is a Israel, publication. There, there, is, there aren't even enough, enough Israelis who understand what you're saying. And that they don't know what's being there said There is a publication Arabic. called Palestinian Media Watch. And it publishes occasionally, uh, not occasionally, uh, quite frequently, they publish pieces of literature or, or media pieces from Palestinian territories. And it, Audrey, when you read this, uh, your blood runs cold. Okay, and do you think people in the State Department read this? I, I don't know what they read. Okay, I certainly know it's not something reported all the time in the American media. And as a result, it, we as American Jews and Americans in general don't get to see the extent to which in Arabic the Palestinian Authority and other leaders in the Palestinian world are speaking very differently than is being portrayed in the general media. Do you not agree? I agree that uh, rep uh, the reporting here is not done well enough to, to represent what's going on over there. Okay. Talk to me now. You participated in the Six Day War. Yes. As a young man. As a young man. I was young once. <laughs> and handsome. You're still handsome. Thank you. Do you remember that time in your life? Oh, I cannot forget it. I will never forget it. First of all, did you ever worry that Israel would lose? Yes, I did. That Can was you one of the motivation. Walk me through that a little bit. Remind me of what you were experiencing at that time and how you experienced the war and then you saw a change. You were there. Take me there for a moment. Okay. Well, it started all on Independence Day. I was in Jerusalem with my wife. Israel Independence Day. Israel Independence Day. The fifth Day. of the ER on the Hebrew calendar. Right. May. I don't remember what year, what month it was. May. In May. In okay. May. It was just about a month before June 6. Okay. And what happens? And uh, on that day, uh, there was an Israeli parade in Jerusalem, which the Arabs protested because, uh, according to the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Jordan, Israel was not supposed to introduce military into Jerusalem. And Israel did not really introduce any weapons into Jerusalem. There were no tanks. There, were no, there was no aircraft. There was no heavy machinery. Just soldiers parading. Uh, on that day, right after the parade ended, uh, Abdel Nasser announced that he was moving troops, Egyptian troops, into the Sinai. And uh, the Syrians announced that they were going to move troops into the Golan Heights. And there was a, like a few days uh, that we didn't really know what was going on. And I was still a student in Jerusalem. And then uh, as, as, as the Arabs or the Egyptian and the Syrians started moving troops, uh, it, it looked like a serious situation. And then Nasser started demanding all sorts of uh, things. Like he said that Beersheba was an Egyptian territory. Then he went and closed the Straits of Tehran. And then they recruited me. And they put me into the military intelligence and telecommunication. Where were you at the time? I was a student in Jerusalem. Roughly how old? Uh, I was uh, 23 years old. OK. Were you married yet? Yes. OK. One a year. They call you and they say they need you. That's right. OK. At that time, do you remember, were you and your wife and your friends frightened? Very much so. Uh, we saw television pictures, uh, uh, television uh, broadcasts from the Sinai Peninsula where the Egyptian military moves and they, they uh, uh, take their swords and their rifles and their guns and they, we're going to kill them all. I thought it was the end of the world, believe me. I was so anxious, so fearful. I didn't really think that Israel was able to push them back. What was your wife's name? What is your wife's name? Shelley. Shelley. And she was frightened also? Oh, yes, very much so. Okay. You get called up. Where do they, where do they station you? 
Well, they stationed me uh, in front of the Golan Heights in one of the kibbutz, uh, kibbutz Gesher, uh, viewing, uh, it's basically uh, uh, east of the, uh, west of the Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, then they told me, look, you are our intelligence expert. We want you to go behind enemy lines and bug their phone lines. And I did. Uh, and uh, I Was that scary? <laughs> very scary, of course. But when you do things like that, you don't think of scary anymore. <laughs> you just go with, with the flow. I how knew that I had you, to do it. How did they get you behind the lines? Uh, at night, of course. <laughs> And uh, they taught me all sorts of ways of getting and finding the, the telephone lines of the enemy because you had to go and find the phone lines. They were on the ground, not in the air, on the ground, uh, and, and, and place bugs on them so that you can listen. I assume you were not alone. Of course not. Okay. You had both Army personnel with you. Were there other also intelligence experts with you? Yes. And your job as a group was to find these telephone lines and bug them. Yes, that was one of the jobs, right. One of the jobs. Right. What was your other job? The other job uh, were listening to uh, Syrian radio. I, I am not fluent in Arabic, although I know a little bit of Arabic. I'm not fluent. Uh, but I had people who were very fluent with me. And uh, they understood everything that uh, these people were saying. And then we had to... Uh, decipher basically what they were saying and, and, and make uh, some intelligent picture out of what they were saying. Um, the war starts June 6th. They, on June 5, they sent me home for a 24-hour break. You had been in Syria prior to this or back at the kibbutz? Back, uh, no, they, I was still in the kibbutz. They sent me home on June 5th. Yes. And uh, I stayed home, uh, spent a great time with my wife. And uh, then the morning of June 6, my father and my wife took me to the, tra to the uh, train station in Haifa where uh, the bus uh, buses were waiting for us, for all the people who were sent home, to take us back to the kibbutz where we were still in Israel. And, uh, and then I saw planes in the air. And, uh, I, and, and then there was an alarm, a, uh, an alarm, basically. And uh, people were running to shelters. That was in Haifa. Apparently, the Syrian Air, uh, the Syrian, uh, air Force uh, was trying to attack the refineries uh, near Haifa. Uh, they missed. Uh, so we, we took, uh, the buses took off, and then about an hour later, I made it to Israel. It's so small. So between the major cities and the front, there is less than an hour. <coughs> so I made it to, to the front. And uh, as I made it to the front, a Syrian MiG was going like this, right above my head, and diving and going up. And, and people around me said, hey, Bravo, Israeli Air Force. And I recognized, I, I knew what the Syrian MiG looked like, and I knew what a uh, Israeli Mister or Mirage, we, at that time Israel had French-made uh, aircraft, looked like. I knew the difference, and I told, I told everybody, lie down. It's, it's a MiG. And then the MiG didn't throw up anything, uh, didn't bomb us, just dived, then went up, and, and then it went back to the Golan Heights, and right there, you saw two Israeli misters following him, and boom, you saw it explode in midair. Uh, but before that, when I arrived, people were telling me that they heard on the news that the Israeli Air Force destroyed the Egyptian Air Force on the ground. And I looked at them and said, what, are you infected by a, a Muslim uh, ima imagination? I mean, this is the way they were talking. So stop it, I said. I didn't believe it. But a few hours later, I realized it was true. Now, I was still in the kibbutz 
for a few days because the war with Syria started on the fourth day of the war. In fact, it was like a two, uh, the, the war, they call it the six day war. It, it better, it's probably better to call it two times two, two plus two plus two days war because the first two days were, uh, were used for a war with Egypt. The next two days or three days, there was one day overlap with Jordan. And then where, when everybody thought the war was over, the, the, uh, we started the war with Syria. So we went into the Golan Heights. And I remember going into the Golan Heights and I was, uh, I was the, the person, the radio person for the, for the commander of the whole front. And on that day, he told me to follow him in the next jeep, or in the next uh, uh, jeep, basically. So I followed him, and he was first with two people, and I followed him in the next vehicle. And then, uh, as, as we were advancing into the Golan Heights, he went on a, on a field mine. And the jeep exploded, and he was killed. So that was my luck. Uh, that I was not in the same vehicle with him. Um, and then we went in and uh, part of our luck was that the Syrians at that point when we went in didn't put out a, uh, a strong fight. Uh, they shot at us and I, ha I saw some of my friends getting hit. Uh, but uh, they did not put a, the fight that I imagined they would. Because I was ready to see myself buried in Israel uh, during that war. I, I, basically, I, I made peace with the idea that I'm not going to survive it. You, you do make peace with that kind of thing uh, at some point. You just resign to the fact that that's the end. Uh, and I was close to the end. Uh, I, was, I saw many people who met that end. And uh, I made it through, and uh, we were able to, to survive and, and win. But you lost friends. I did lose quite a few friends, yes. Do you remember any of them? Oh, yeah. Yes. Any of them close friends? They were colleagues more than friends, because we met during that uh, period. Uh, but when you are in a close military relationship, you become very, very strong friend with, with your colleagues. So that was the kind of friendship. I have other friends who were killed in the war, uh, but not together with me. They were not fighting next to me. They killed in different fronts. But say this again. You really expected yourself that you would not survive the war. Yes, I did. I, not only that, in fact, before the war, I did not expect Israel to win. I expected the whole country to be wiped off the map. So it, it wasn't just me. I, I, it wasn't just me. I had visions of everybody in my family being killed. And then at some point, you realize Israel is going to survive. That's right. Do you remember that? That was the happiest day of my life when I came, when I made it back to the kibbutz. And people told me that Israeli Air Force destroyed the Egyptian Air Force on the ground and the Syrian Air Force. I think I didn't believe it at first. I wanted to believe it, but I did not. I thought that was a good dream, but it was hard to believe. And then a few hours later, when it became clear, because we were listening to the radio, and it became clear that that was true, that was an unbelievable moment. I, I, cannot, I cannot think of any happier moment in my life. Yes. Do you remember speaking to your wife? No. I, well, uh, you have to remember, in 1967, we did not have telephones available from the field. We did not have cell phones. So, no, I did not speak to her. I did not speak to her. I, I, don't, I don't remember when I spoke to her uh, during or after the war. 
I probably didn't even speak to her. She didn't know when the war was over. I mean, she didn't expect me to come home when the war was over. She didn't know where I was. I did not speak to her. When you go to Syria, it's after you know that the Israeli Air Force has destroyed the Egyptian Air Force on the ground. Uh, yes and, but and no. You, but yes and you, no. Yet why no? Because I went to Syria even before that. Okay. But when you come back from Haifa on June 6th, you're still worried that Israel is going to lose the war? Yes. Yes. And then, even after you hear about the Egyptian army being destroyed, the Air Force being destroyed, you have to go behind Syrian lines. That's correct. And when you go there, you also have made peace with the fact you might not come back. That's right. How long are you behind the lines? Um, like five hours. Okay, and then you do come back. And, and then I, I went several times. Several times. Yes. Each time you knew your life was at risk. Oh, yes. It and, was pounding. Okay. At some point you also hear that we, we, that Israel has taken the old city of Jerusalem. Yes. And that there are Israelis standing at the Western Wall. That's right. In America, that's a big deal. Was it a big deal for you? Huge deal. Huge De deal. I describe remember. that. Okay. Uh, uh, let me describe something even before that. I lived in Jerusalem before the war. Jerusalem was a divided city. There was a wall in the middle of the city. And there was a total unknown behind the wall. Mystery. It was a great mystery. What is going on, uh, what, what is going on behind that wall? We didn't see it because the wall was pretty high. And uh, we knew that the Western Wailing Wall was there. We knew that the mosques were there. We knew that the church was there. But it was all like a, 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 uh, a movie for us. It wasn't real. And uh, when, when they announced that Israel made it, that Israel conquered the, the city of Jerusalem, the eastern side of the city, that was like, wow, a dream. It's not a dream anymore. It's real. So uh, it was an amazing moment. The whole, the whole period, I cannot, I cannot forget that whole period. It wasn't six days for me. It was like a two-month period for me. Because after the war, I came to Jerusalem because I lived there. And I had a, uh, a motorcycle. And I took my wife in the back, and we went into the old city to see all this stuff. I'm telling you, this was like an experience. It's like landing on the moon. The old city of Jerusalem was the moon for us. It's the same feeling. Did it affect at all how you felt about Israel? Well, I felt that I played a part in, in saving it. That was, and, and I, I felt like not only I belong there, but it belongs to me as well. That's very beautiful, Avi. By any chance, do you remember this is the period when Naomi Shemer writes Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold. By any chance, do you remember if that <coughs> melody affected you at all? Do you remember it, or is it, again, it happened, but that wasn't one of the standout memories in your own mind? Well, I remember it very well. Um, uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the fact that I was a musician, I had my band, and people were getting married in, in Jerusalem, and my band was the most popular band in Jerusalem. And I played in many, many weddings. What was it called? I'd call Avi's Band. Avi's Band. <laughs> right. <laughs> Perfect. Very Israeli. Go ahead. Right. And uh, at that time, yeah, uh, we have to put everything in perspective because uh, at that time we had no television, uh, in Israel anyway. And uh, we only had the radio. And, and we didn't have the technology we have today. We didn't have iPhones. So uh, we didn't have names for, for bands. 
we we should have called ourselves the Beatles, but we didn't even, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, so I played Jerusalem of Gold. I played it in every wedding, and everybody was singing, and it was. Uh, and uh, but there was a another song that made even stronger impression on me during the war. And there was a song that described. It was a. Uh, uh, what we call in Israel uh, um, a military uh, troop uh, that uh, I, w I was in one act actually as a musician and as an actor. I was an actor too. Um, and I played uh, my Chaim Topol, probably many people in the United States recognize him from Fiddler on the Roof. He was my director in, in that. So I was an actor as well and a musician. And, and uh, we, uh, and one of the troops uh, was uh, singing that song that described the battle of uh, on, of Jerusalem, and it was a great song, and that was the song that really talked to me more than even Jerusalem of Gold. Do eight bars for me. Da 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 if I sing it in Hebrew, uh, people will not understand. But uh, that do you remember the words? Do you not very well. I, I'm not very okay. good in lyrics okay. anyway. Okay. I I don't even remember lyrics of American songs. I I know the melody because because I'm a musician. I don't pay attention to lyrics that much. I always when I listen when I hear a song when I listen to it, I immediately try to analyze the harmony, the arrangement, and I forget to pay attention to the lyrics. So that's my nature, and it's. A deficiency I recognize. In America, yes, and, a, and we are told in the former Soviet Union, Israel's victory in the Six-Day War changed Jewish self-identity. That's right. In the American Jew, in right. the Jew in the former Soviet Union, did it change the Israeli identity? Did you, feel, did you walk differently? Did the Israeli walk differently after the Six Day War? We didn't walk differently, we talked differently. I, I, and actually it was, it was bad, it wasn't good. Uh, we felt like super people, like Superman. Uh, we defeated six, Arab, I mean three Arab armies who had a military advantage, I mean in terms of equipment over us. Uh, they had many more people, much larger military force we defeated and we got rid of them in six days. It was an amazing thing. We were supermen. And the rest of the world treated us like that. In fact, Israel on that day when the war was over, before the war started, we were David versus Goliath. After the war, we were the Goliaths. <coughs> we were no longer Davids. And it didn't serve us well internationally uh, in years to come. Right immediately after the war, the world was in awe. I mean, they, 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 the rest of the world looked at Israel as, as, wow, these people are unbelievable. Great, great, great. I mean, they admired us. But then we became occupiers. And then, of course, we became the bad people, the Goliaths. And today we are the Goliath. So it comes back to our discussion earlier about what to do about the situation. How do you change the image? How do you, how do you change the situation? Do you still love the state of Israel? I love it. I love it dearly. I, uh, I think about it all the time. I read about it all the time. I write about it all the time. It, it, it's, it probably takes about 35 to 50 percent of my brain <laughs> the thinking about it is uh, yes what a joy it is to talk to you uh, and I'm thank you for letting me pick your brains and to ask you for, to reminisce and to think um, I'm now not only going to turn to you as somebody who, who should participate in some of our roundtable discussions and and hear your opinion but from time to time I may want you to come in just talk to me about sure. your personal experiences you're a real gentleman, a, a mensch, and it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm it's so a glad. Pleasure I here thank too. Zahava Gordon for bringing you to me. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Avi, really, Koltuba. I'm very happy 
that I uh, had the opportunity. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Much. You make me very happy too. Thank you. And that was my meeting with Avi Perry, a remarkable human being who has this extraordinary background in electronics, does work in uh, many studies and is an analyst and has his own talk show and, and has written a novel, his first novel, 72 Virgins. So there you go. An amazing human being. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments. Email me. Write me. Post on our Facebook wall. Tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish education in media.